I want to say that this is indeed a very uh, rich, complex, and at times, as we had in the first part, a paradoxical, if not utterly contradictory, a set of assumptions, of visions, um, and uh, yeah, par paradoxes. You're going to see lots of very strange things um, uh, appearing and happening at the same time. And let's start from the beginning. And the reason why we start with this icon of the transfiguration is not to pay homage to the Museum of uh, Russian History and where it is located in uh, this glorious setting of the Holy Trinity Monastery in Jordanville, but it is because, as you see on the slide, uh, the, you find this particular icon in, not in a church, but in the Simile Museum. And what, why is the Simile mu Museum important to what we're looking at today? Well, that is because we know a lot of what happened at the end of the Soviet Union. And the, the, the slide you have to the right is a photograph, is a document of one of the last performances that a group of artists uh, did uh, at the beginning of the demise of the USSR. When you have an extraordinary repository of documents and archives of the, those dissenting forms of art practices against the monolithic bloc of the USSR, the Soviet ideology. Uh, few of them went to prison, but they were all clearly in opposition to the uh, overwhelming, oppressing um, Marxist-Leninist ideology in uh, the last decade of the USSR. And when you go to this collection, which is now based in New Jersey, interestingly enough, the first thing you see is this uh, icon. So there is a very particular reason why you see, and you don't see just one icon, you see actually six or seven early fascinating 16th, 17th century icons, extraordinary. And then in between those two slides, you see the famous Malievich, one of the famous Malievich uh, Suprematist compositions, white on white, he's more famous, of course, for the black square, we will see that later. So my, this is the menu that I'm engaging you to, uh, and to, to see, to, to uh, share with me today, how do we reconcile, if at all, those three utterly different uh, images, what do they have in common, and what do they tell us about 20th century Russian art? I'm just going to throw this immediately, as you know, for those of you who um, know a little bit about the Transfiguration, uh, in the um, uh, Gospels, Christ is described in the Transfiguration as being dressed in light, this cloak of white blazing light that blinds you. And so that might be perhaps, at least on the visual front, a uh, uh, shared uh, relationship between those three images, but expect some surprises. And the one biggest, perhaps, I mentioned several paradoxes, but definitely there is one that is at the core of everything we're going to look at, and that is that, in a way, uh, most of the uh, so Soviet ideological uh, overarching theme is, to, is, is, is atheism. It's a, it's a society that establishes on the basis of Marxist-Leninist principles and that pushes away in some very often violent, uh, murderous, uh, delitos uh, forms that pushes away the presence of the church. It never eradicates the presence of the church, that should be said, uh, but we're not going to go into this, that would be too more into the social and, and uh, sociological aspect of the USSR, that's not why, where I want to go. But I, what I'm interested in looking, especially with this extraordinary uh, citation from John 118, no man hath seen God at any time. Uh, the citation itself is longer and much more interesting, but I just want to take this particular segment because in a strange way, this is something that is not in contradiction with the USSR. Uh, it's not in contradiction with the way uh, many Russian artists have looked at, have approached art, um, and the, the kind of this kind of, you could, could almost say a hide and seek game between artists, cultural agents in the Soviet civilization, 
from the beginning, the late 1917, 1917 until the very end, 1989, the, the last the, the, the last years of the, of the 80s. So I just want to start immediately and give you, so we're starting now looking at what happens around the uh, Russian Revolution of 17. And I want to show you before we get in, we're going to go back to where I started last time in March, but I want to show you where we are, not in Russia, but in Western Europe. And I chose to focus on an event that had immense, immense uh, replica, replica, I mean, important uh, consequences, uh, and that is the creation of Dada, Dada, a form of art that celebrated chaos, celebrated disorder, celebrated irrationality, celebrated madness, you could say, in a way. This so-called Dada movement, which occurs only, you see to the, the slide to your left, a strange thing about Soviet Russia is that in its own Soviet capsule, it is not in it's it's not in opposition, it's not in contradiction with this extraordinary line from John 118. Let's go to the next one. And I, as I was saying, I wanted to, and the next one, I want to show you the context of what happens outside Russia at the turn, uh, just, just at the beginning of the uh, Russian Revolution. So we have the first data slide, uh, the poster of the opening of Cabaret Voltaire in 1916, the famous urinal by Duchamp in 1917, the idea of posing a, a urinal and calling it a work of art is utterly strange and, and weird and nonsensical uh, action that, that was at the core of Dada. And the next slide, you see the Cabaret Voltaire. I'm interested in showing you that, that little building, which still is in extant today in the old part of Zurich, as you see, uh, today it's a walking part, uh, it's a pedestrian uh, district in Zurich. And you see the little street that veers to the right. Well, that's Spiegelgasse, where the entrance to that cabaret where Dada was created happened. Uh, and you see to the, to the far right, Hugo Ball, who is this German speaking uh, poet, performer, uh, Weird individual, let's call it, let's call it, call it as it is, and who is at the head, who is the, fo the fermenter, the source of this Dada movement in its utter craziness is not too strong a word. But what I'm interested in looking at with this particular photograph is what he's wearing. And look at the shape of this, the cloak he has that's, that's co closing, that's, uh, that surrounds his neck behind and even his hat. Now, doesn't that remind you somewhat of an Orthodox priest or possibly bishop uh, cloak? It doesn't have, doesn't this have a particular, if, if not a sort of generic religious connotation? In fact, what is, I, I promised you several uh, paradoxes, and here's the first one. Uh, we know that Hugo Ball was very, very interested in Byzantine. Uh, scriptures in Byzantine history. He himself wrote not a small book, but a several, several hundred pages book on Byzantine Christianity, a book which, this is what I find fascinating, was never translated into English. So we're going to go over several times this kind of uh, pushing aside of anything religious, I'm not even mentioning the word spiritual, but anything that is kind of openly religious is kept out, carefully out of the modernist envelope, of the modernist conception of uh, what modern art is, is about. So this uh, Hugo Ball not only was a, a very uh, interesting specialist of Byzantine Christianity, but he uh, also came up with an etymology of the word da, da, and he said this is, a repetition of the initials of Dionysius the Aeropagite, whose patron name day, by the way, is on the 16th of October, but that's a detail. Uh, so if you repeat DA, Dionysius the Aeropagite, Dionysius the Aeropagite, you get DA, da, da. Now, this uh, 
explanation, etymological explanation of the formation of this slightly crazy term Dada is in complete contradistinction, if not opposition, to the more prevalent explanation, which is one by another Dada artist called Kurt, Kurt Schwitters. Kurt Schwitters' theory or explanation is that um, they were at this particular cabaret that you see to the left, and they thought as a game to thrust a, a, a knife blade inside a dictionary, opened it randomly, and fell on the word Dada. Just giving you this uh, this bifurcate, this uh, triangulation to get to give you a sense of how complex, even within the framework of, of Dada, it is difficult to make sense of, um, of, of this particular movement. But most importantly, how the any kind of religious connotations is is literally, if not deleted, censored or edited out and left um, out. So here's a sense of the kind of literature. This is a, the text that uh, Bal was reciting on the opening day of this uh, Cabaret Voltaire, the, 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 the formation of Dada. Words are absolutely incomprehensible in any language, and that is the point, in a way, of what Dada is about. So now let's go back this. For those of you who attended the last lecture, the last two lectures, the aborted second lecture or the first lecture uh, uh, in, in March, this should be somewhat uh, familiar. And you might wonder how we go from this to what we've just seen. It will become very quickly uh, apparent. So in the late 19th century, under the aegis of the Tsar Alexander III, uh, namely, uh, even though he was continuing the, the impetus or the thrust of what I think his grandfather Nicola, Nicolai I had done, but what Alexander III did was uh, not just to foster a new interest, new taste, new uh, awareness for the Byzantine uh, Christian uh, uh, culture, but he decided to establish a sort of state-like uh, impetus to, to start collecting uh, with a, a very uh, uh, aggressive uh, uh, way to acquire collections, not in Russia, not just in Russia. This particular uh, slide that you see here, the room in Alexander Bachilevsky, uh, residence in Paris, this particular uh, is one of many collections, this is the Bachilevsky collection, and it entered the, Hermit the Hermitage under Alexander III's impetus in 1884. Multiply this by the dozens, literally. Uh, and let's go to the next uh, slide. And you have here, only a few years later, about 15 years later, throughout the turn of the century, to your left, a view of Christian antiquities in the newly formed museum that is specifically directed, mandate to, to towards uh, collecting, curating, thinking about Byzantine iconography. That is unprecedented. Uh, Dean uh, Nikolai Jurevich uh, Shidlovsky had a very interesting question for me uh, in the past. He said, well, I, are you saying that there were no icons before in Russia? Of course not, yes. And there were hundreds, thousands and thousands of icons, needless to say. But, uh, but, uh, uh, but what is new is this state initiative to not just collect icons, but turn, turn Byzantine art into a particular branch of art history. As bizarre as this may sound, this is another paradox, there was no such thing as, an art, as a Byzantine art history until the turn of the 20th century. Now, what is the connection between this and the painting to, the, to your right? Wait, here's a famous black square. Let's go to the next slide, Anastasia. And here, basically, you have three characters we, we could also have multi multiplied this easily by three or four, and then a dozen and, and more of them, but these are the most uh, prevalent one, Father Pavel Florensky, Nikolai Punin, Nikolai Tarabukin, each one of whom were major, major specialists in Byzantine iconography and endorsed a few, a couple of decades later, uh, people like Malievich, Kandinsky, and the beginning of the Russian avant-garde. How strange is this? Well, not so strange when you read what uh, Florensky, uh, Father, Father Pavel Florensky uh, claimed 
when he said that the Russo Byzantine art tradition consciously discarded linear perspective. Now, when you read this already, even though this is in the 1890s, you kind of see almost uh, uh, in, um, as a, the premises of, of, of the creation of, of modern art itself, discarding linear perspective, presumably after its initial invention and proliferation in the 15th century, in order to communicate a more complex and more sophisticated idea than the mere simulacrum of the external world. So this, when, when uh, Florensky utters the, these words, uh, suprematism and the Russian revolution, the Russian uh, avant-garde, as we call it, has not even begun to, to exist. But the words in which he cultures what you might call the revolution of Byzantine art is in a way in complete kinship and is sort of almost calling for something that will become the modernist revolution in Russia. He goes further than that. He uh, opposes what he calls religious art versus uh, iconic uh, representation. Religious art is the kind, what he calls uh, basically the Italian Renaissance, the kind of art produced during the Renaissance. Uh, and it was fundamentally different from what he called sacred art, which has to do with iconic representation, which is what we know today as Byzantine art. The latter Byzantine art ought to be thought of as visualizing theologically or as uh, so representations of God's words materialized as images whose true function hinged on the articulation of what Florensky again calls a divine reality. I don't need to go back into the, the Italian Renaissance, but you see how very, very far we are from the Italian Renaissance uh, mindset and, and how interestingly enough, strangely enough, we are very, very close to what's going to happen only a decade later. And so for Florensky, finally, the Middle Ages, uh, which is usually considered as the core period of the Byzantine Empire, were a contemplative and creative era in contrast to what he calls the predatory and mechanical modernity of recent times, and especially the modernity of the late 19th century. So when he opposes Byzantine art to modern art, that's what is most interesting. He thinks of what we saw in the last lecture, the 19th century. What these three guys also have in common is they hate Impressionism. They consider Impressionism as the last link of a tradition of rendering reality too perfectly, too naturally. One had to get away from this and create and give space for uh, a form of contemplation that allowed the divine reality. So naturally, you're going to tell me, uh, let's go to the next slide, Anastasia, if you don't mind. Uh, you're going to tell me, well, what's the space for the divine reality in Soviet Russia, in, in the, the, the Russian avant-garde? Well, that's what we are going to see now. Now, these are three quotes, maybe that's, they're too long to read uh, all of them, but they, these are quotes by each three of these Byzantinists not in the 1890s, when they were very active, but in the 1920s. And what are they looking at now? They're looking at what we saw just two slides ago, but um, uh, yeah, the, the black square, basically. We're going to see several, several images there. And I, I just want to, to go through just the first sentence of each. All the schoolrooms, says Father Lorensky, all the schoolroom rules, the schoolroom rooms, he, he means by that the academy that fostered Italian art and its uh, succession successors uh, throughout the centuries in Western Europe are overturned with such daring, their violation is masterfully emphasized, and the resulting icon, icon, now he's not talking about a Byzantine icon, he's referring to people like Malievich and, and Kandinsky, whom we're going to see in a second, conveys so much about itself and its artistic achievements to a spontaneous artistic taste that there can no longer be any doubt. The incorrect and mutually contradictory details of drawing represent a complex artistic calculation, which, if you wish, you may call daring, but by no means naive. So this is a this is a uh, systematic, um, you know, a systematic uh, defense of the new aesthetic that comes in with the Russian avant-garde and the revolution. Uh, Nikolai Punin, another great, great Byzantinist, who talks now about Tatlin 
uh, Tatlin was uh, Malievich's direct uh, colleague, but also competitor. Art no longer reflects life or living conditions, but being a, being a part of it, like every, every, everything living, it forms the world. We see one of the greatest achievements of the new artists in the fact that art has acquired the role of the forming principle. The credit belongs to Tatlin and Malievich. Yeah. Now, I, you know, even though I tried to explain, to articulate in front of you the, 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 logis, the logical uh, rationale that takes them from Byzantine uh, iconography to the Russian avant-garde, it still is quite uh, extraordinary to read those words by people who were responsible for Alexander III's thrust in, in creating a new science of Byzantine iconography and who uh, only 20 years later or less were great supporters of Tatlin and, and Malievich. I think here's in a way part of the uh, visualization of, of what I mean. So Malievich, you will see uh, himself was very, very more than interested. I mean, he was very immersed in uh, thinking theologically about abstraction. Kandinsky, who is known art historically in the West as the father of abstraction. Well, what is less known and what was almost never talked about until very recently is that he had a phenomenal collection of icons. He was, he had an immense, immense interest in Russian folk imagery, uh, religious imagery uh, and, and, and kept that collection always. And what is less uh, apparent too is, is the fact that in, in his own imagery that leads to abstraction, you know, what the painting to the left we get the title, All Saints 1, 1911. That's the time, the 1910, 1911, that is usually the time given by art historians for the birth of abstraction. Well, that particular painting is directly, we know now, uh, borrows its sources from one of the several, several icons uh, uh, that, that he owned, namely the fiery ascension of the prophet um, uh, Elijah. He had an image of this and you see to the left, I don't have an, an, an arrow to point out, but you see this uh, to the middle left part, this white part is in fact a horse uh, carrying uh, behind uh, a, an individual that leans backward to the right with a green uh, oval head. It's almost a symmetric rendering of, of this icon of the fiery ascension of the prophet Elijah that you have to the right. Um, next, Anastasia. So here's an even more uh, evidence. So we, the, 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 this particular um, image to your left is also almost also an in, inversion, symmetrical inversion uh, and simplification, abstraction, if you will, of the iconography of Saint George, Saint George and the Dragon. Uh, ne next. And here's our black square to which we're going to refer several times. But here, what I'm interested in is to look at the way it was this, this uh, 1915 exhibition in what was called then Petrograd. Uh, it represents how Malievich first showed to the public his work and the famous uh, black icon, black, sorry, black square, I, I saw it, is presented like an icon. So let's uh, uh, go to the next one. And you see this typical orthodox way of presenting icons. Uh, let's go then now back to the black square. And here's this uh, extraordinary uh, quotation from Malievich himself about five years after the creation of the black square, which is now at the Tretiakovskaya Galleria in Moscow. Uh, the square has become live, producing a no new world of perfection. And you notice, by the way, the, the, the similar intonations is what um, Father uh, Aviel was, uh, was saying earlier on. It occurred to me that if mankind painted an image of the deity in its own image, then maybe the black square is an image of God as the essence of his perfection on the new path of today's beginning. Now, this is another major, major paradox. And if I, I don't see my audience, I love to see my audience, but I could imagine that many of you are frowning their eyebrows over there and thinking, what are we reading here? What is this? There are at least two paradoxes, maybe more. 
that are uh, captured in this particular quotation in relationship to the black square. Uh, one, obviously, uh, we're seeing nothing and we are seeing if uh, we are to believe Malievich himself in this letter to a friend of his, we're seeing, we're seeing an image of deity in its own image. Uh, that's the first one. But the second one, which to me is maybe even more complex, more difficult to swallow, in a way, to, to, to break down and to, to understand simply, is the fact that he is, and, and, and the, the three critics I, I mentioned, including uh, Father uh, Baviel, uh, you know, come from the same um, source, so the same tradition, the same background, and uh, embrace the new age. What is interesting is that they, are, they do not, not only do they not oppose the beginning of the USSR, or the, it's not even called the USSR, but the, the beginning of this new age, but they embrace it as what Malievich calls the new path of today's beginning. Now you will see that this period I called, I started calling it utopia, uh, will soon be followed by a period of uh, dire disenchantment. Uh, but we'll go that. We'll go to that next. Let's uh, go to the next slide. And so I'm just showing you these images because they are, if anything, uh, rather funny and uh, I mean uh, interesting. Uh, irony is always always there. So the black square not only is seen as an icon, an icon of God in its own image, uh, as per Malievich's word, but it becomes itself like an insignum. And I'm I'm showing you here this this uh, group of the famous Unovis group and led by Kazimierz Malievich. So all these people are his disciples. He's right at the center with uh, the hat carrying this uh, uh, round, uh, circular, abstract image. But above him, right above him, his head with the, the, uh, the red arrow, I want to show you this little insignia. This is a little pin that every one of the Unovis uh, militants, in a way, uh, would take to show their religious affiliation, in a sense, to the new group, to the new vision that came out of the uh, October Revolution, it's putting the square, the black square, as a new form of expression. Let's go to the next, Anastasia. Good. Uh, yeah. So another uh, quotation where we here is couched, I mean, we're very, well, not far from the 1915 moment, but here, interestingly enough, uh, Malievich appears to embrace, to, to, to collapse in a very, again, difficult to decipher, difficult to, 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 to pass out uh, the, the Marxist-Leninist uh, ideology and the continuation of an iconic and religious attitude towards the world. So the culture of creating gods passed unnoticed in our time when we started to exist. Try as we might to overthrow the idols on the square, to throw them down the, from the altars. All of a sudden you look and see that one of our comrades has inconspicuously become a god. Art will make him an icon, distribute among us so that everyone may know and see the new god. So here for a moment, you see Malievich basically sort of transferring, almost in a psychoanalytical sense, by the way, no, transferring, shifting sort of his alliances from religion to the new system that will create a new God. And that weird moment, uh, let's go to the next uh, slide, if you don't mind, a weird moment of apparent uh, harmonization, of, of apparent comradeship, com comradeship um, friendship, between the new system and the political uh, revolution that fostered, that allowed that system to come out is going to be very, very short lived and we're going to see why. But I'm just interested here in the sheer, sheer visual analogy, even though the painting by Vladimir Serov uh, showing Lenin, it's a much, much later painting, but it's you know in complete and utter opposition to what Malievich and his uh, uh, comrades were trying to foster as a new aesthetic, but look at the similar gesturing between Malievich, who's the new leader of this aesthetic form, and Lenin parading the principles of Soviet power. Let's go to the next one. 
So that image is super, super famous. And we're going to see what, what happens to it later. But what I'm actually interested is to have you now look at Lenin, Lenin's quote here. Lenin was often in a, among uh, Marxist or sympathizers of Marxism, presented as far more enlightened than his successor Stalin, far more open, far more enlightened and, and willing to embrace the new utopian vision of a, of a new art aesthetics. Well, well, look at what he says. I'm unable to consider works of expressionism, futurism, cubism. He names them, he does put a shopping list right there and then, and all the reasons, I mean, constructivism, suprematism, for instance, as the highest manifestation of artistic genius. He's unable to do that, you understand? He's therefore completely denigrating it. I don't understand them. They give me no joy whatsoever. What a slap in the face. And this is done at the same, the same year as you heard these incredible boastful statements by Malievich, and I could have multiplied that, that again by the dozens. So let's go to the next one. You see how that, that vision, that, lit, that uh, position of, of Lenin uh, declaimed, you know, as an orator, as almost like a Roman uh, orator on, in the forum, became itself the signal of the, um, of the proletarian uh, Soviet revolution. It was reproduced all over the place. And Lisitsky himself, uh, one of the uh, ardent champions of the new Russian avant-garde, creates this image that became very, very uh, well known. And uh, let's go to the next uh, slide. And so here, here we see Russian constructivism championing Lenin everywhere, but we know now that this was definitely uh, an unrequited love story, for sure. Let's keep going. And so here's the famous Tatlin with uh, his, the, the, the tower, the monument to the Third International. You see it on the constructor uh, to the right. Uh, you see it in its uh, finished form to the left. The interesting thing, let's keep going. The interesting thing is that this particular uh, monument to the Third International was never constructed. Only the, the, the model that we see to the left was done. And so what I'm throwing you now, we're moving it well into the end of the USSR. I'm giving you a little bit of a, uh, how can I say, a hint of what will happen. You will see that the artists who live two, three generations after the present, after these, these guys, Malievich, Tatlin, Lisitsky and so on, will become, will turn irony against their own predecessors for a different, different reasons. And by the way, that particular sculpture by Sternberg is also at the Zimmerli Museum in uh, New Jersey. Let's keep going. So what, what I'm interested in, in, in seeing here is the, the fact that this, these utopians, I use the word utopia in the, the, the title of the lecture, it's, it's almost exactly technically the, 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 the factual description of what happened or what more precisely did not happen. The monument to the Third International was never created. You only see it through a model. And this idea of, of almost uh, rising to heaven, this which is couched so superbly by this painting by Bruegel uh, than 500 years uh, earlier of the Tower of Babel. Let's go to the next slide. And in a, in a sense, uh, this quote from the Genesis is, is absolutely perfect. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heaven so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. Well, this uh, dichotomy, this uh, alternative, we know uh, what, uh, what happened uh, when we applied it to the Soviet world. Uh, let's keep going. Soviet history. Oh, uh, yes, so we go from utopia to dystopia. I, I, uh, I, did you show that sl slide, Anastasia, the title slide? Yes. And what I'm interested in looking at the way, again, this is another, so let's go to the next one now. Here again, we are in the Simoli Museum with a picture to the, to the right. So another weird paradox 
uh, and we're, we're going to go over it a little bit uh, uh, in the next few images, but of, of those artists in Soviet Russia, born and raised in the USSR, unlike there, uh, Malievich, Lesitsky, uh, and all the people we've spoken to about who were born in Imperial Russia, came with a tradition that was absolutely not, nothing like what the tradition of people like Elena, Elagina, or Andrei Makarevich uh, uh, were. These, these people not only, only knew about the Soviet ideology, the Soviet world, even though they refuted it and they opposed it, but they were completely uh, formed, educated within that particular world. And what you need to know is that, uh, and we're going to see that in a, in a, in a slide or two, du during, very quickly on during Stalin, and I don't believe, as I mentioned before, that Stalin was less, uh, was, sorry, was more obtuse than his friend and predecessor Lenin. I think both of them were utterly disinterested, disenchanted by what the so-called Russian avant-garde had to offer. And so very soon, all the works that we've seen so far, the, 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 the great iconic black square and everything that Malievich produced, everything that he's dozens or so of colleagues of uh, either the constructivist group or the suprematist group produced became invisible to the Soviet public, to the museum world in Soviet Russia. But it became hyper visible in the West. And we're going to see why in a moment. So you have this, this uh, imagine this generation lit, lit USSR of Russian artists who are brought up on uh, uh, socialist realism, and who know through illegally imported Western art magazines that what the West is worshipping is the initial source of creation of abstraction and suprematism that Malievich and his likes were responsible for, but which the Russians themselves were not entitled to see. You, you, you follow me? I mean, it's, it, you, you can imagine the kind of complications uh, and and um, uh, absurdity, really, the, 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 the psychologically, intellectually, culturally, that this led to. And so, I, I found this image of the of the Tatlin's monument to the, of the Third International on uh, uh, what we call in English um, a talk stool. But let's go to the next uh, uh, slide for uh, those for those of you who uh, may not be familiar with this very important. Uh, mushroom in Russian, in the Russian world, Mohamor. Mohamor means actually uh, the, the death um, the fly killer, right? Is a, um, uh, I think that's the, mm -hmm. basically it's a, it, an infectious uh, mushrooms, very, very popular in fact in Soviet homes because it killed insects, it killed uh, flies. So it's both attractive and noxious, noxious and, uh, and dangerous and the recreating the Tatin uh, International Tower on top of this Muhammad is um, is both funny and insane and insensitive and uh, offensive in a sense. So they, there's always a combination of laughing and cynicism, gloom and and doom, but yet always with a smile uh, on the face. Very interesting. Let's go to the next uh, slide, and let's go back to uh, this other very strange. Uh, marriage of contradictions, you might say. Now, in a, in a sense, and this is also a quote from 1920. The, the last two quotes by Malievich were also 1920. So this is extremely interesting. Now, let's read this quote. Now, in the name of Lucifer, all the eyes, the egos, right, the selves, have been taken out of the kingdom of God and into the kingdom of the unity of the we. Now, what is the kingdom of the unity of the we? Well, this is obviously the USSR, the socialist uh, regime where individuality is proscribed, prohibited, no room for the bourgeois ego. We need to uh, fuse all these egos into a massive we, into a non-divine kingdom. Now, I don't know about you, but I read this as, as a complete condemnation of the existing budding Soviet regime, a regime that has essentially pushed out of the kingdom of God all the eyes, all the possibilities of subject, of 
individuals to exist has been eradicated, and that is indeed correct. But he says that has been done in whose name? Not Lenin, Stalin, but Lucifer. So how did he not go immediately to prison? Well, probably because it was only 1920, uh, and the USSR was still in its formation stage. It's not until 1924, by the way, that for it goes seven years for the Soviet army, the Red Army, to conquer uh, at down to Vladivostok, the, 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 the Russian space and uniform it, I mean, uniform it, uh, amalgamate it under its Soviet imprimatur. So they were probably not, uh, they were too busy by other matters. But I find this quote absolutely fascinating. And of course, the image that goes with it tells you about the in, inner, I call paradox here, but here it's more a, a contradiction, an outright contradiction that is at the core of Malievich's own um, uh, uh, Weltanschauung, his conception of the world. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, and this is another fascinating image of we could, the supremacy of the spirit, 1919, just a year before. We could read it in so many, uh, so many forms. Um, uh, that I will leave it to, to you and to your imagination. And that, but it doesn't require much imagination to, to see what is going on here. Let's go to the next slide, please. And so, as I said to you before, uh, you could almost tell that from the earliest quotes by Lenin himself that the joyful, promising, dreamful years of utopia uh, created, uh, fomented by, by Malievich, by, by Lisitsky, by uh, Tatlin and, and many others, Rosanova, and, and so on and so forth, would be short-lived because the Soviet leader himself said it outright. This bores him. He finds it utterly joyless, boring, empty. And what the uh, leaders, Lenin, Stalin, and their uh, nomenclatura, are going to do gradually is to push out this early abstraction world and replace it, supersede any form of Russian avant-garde, which will suddenly be marginalized and in invisible to most of the Soviet uh, audience and replace it by what we know as socialist realism. And that takes place at a very particular point between 1932 and 1933 on two uh, major exhibitions uh, that took place one in uh, um, one in Moscow and one in Leningrad. You're seeing the one in Leningrad, and in that particular exhibition, you see Malievich, who is it's very symbolically by himself, pushed out. He's completely secluded from the rest of the exhibition, and the, the rest of the exhibition is what you see to the left. Re massive return to uh, re rep re representational art uh, that could sort of in, in a way resemble what we saw in the first lecture, but it's much, it is also in, inflected with a new ideology reflecting what the new uh, Soviet uh, heroes, the new Soviet individual is going to look like. So this is the sort of death arrest, uh, symbolically put, of suprematism of Malievich. The case of, uh, let's go to the next one. The case of Tatlin is even worse. He is completely, he's not even exhibited. He's not been invited, rejected. And what is fascinating to me is that, had that happened to me, I, 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 I'm, as an artist, i sure I would have been blissfully, I mean, wounded and, and, and angry. But let's see what, what uh, Tatlin says, how he explains what goes on. Is he angry at the regime? He, he suddenly bitterly complained, yes, at one of the debates held in Moscow, but he says, I attributed a great deal of importance to the 15 years exhibition. That's what we just saw, where he was not shown. But my work was not displayed, which is wrong, since I really should have been, I should have had some place in the history of art. By not exhibiting me, artists seem to have excluded me from their ranks. So who are the, the culprits? Who are the ones responsible for this? Is it Stalin? Is it the, his minister, minister of culture? No, it's other artists. How naive can that be? You know, and uh, I find this, uh, this, this is one of the last, I mean, this is the, part, the end point of the first part of this uh, talk. We're going to move on faster in the next part, I hope. But uh, 
What is interesting in this uh, statement by Tatlin is that he is, as they all are, uh, fully aware, I really should have some place in the history of art. Now here, he's not going to be disappointed, except that he's never going to know it. What happens, you need to know that, and this is another crazy paradox, is that in 1932-33, in this country now, in New York, where I'm sitting, uh, in 1929, we have the creation of the Museum of Modern Art. Uh, the director, the founding director, is a very young guy who hasn't finished his PhD from Harvard called Alfred Barr. And one of the first major uh, journeys, trips that Barr undertakes in order to start looking at modern art worldwide is, guess where, in Soviet Russia. He goes there in 1932 for a few weeks and stays there several months in Stalin's dark years of the USSR. And he starts buying by the dozens those works of art which are suddenly discarded by Soviet Russia, by the Soviet authorities. But suddenly the Soviets have it both ways. They cannot stand this kind of thing. And they find this young apparent American idiot who's willing to pay for, for them. So it's a pure blessing for the Soviet authorities. So indeed, Tatlin will have his wish fulfilled, but never in front of his own eyes. So that is what I began to say before. America will soon celebrate, especially after World War II, the, the thrust of abstraction as a new form of art embodying the freedom, the liberties of the Western world against the uh, authoritarian of Soviet Russia. The absolute irony of this being that abstraction was a language created by whom? Russian artists, at least two of them, Kandinsky and Malievich. Let's go to the next slide. So Chagall occupied a very important uh, junction in, in this, but I, I want to move on. I love this, this uh, slide just in terms of what's happening now architecturally and wait for another crazy paradox coming. So here's the kind of uh, architecture that Malievich himself had foreseen. For me, I will tell you outright, I cannot understand uh, what's going on here. The same individual, and I'm not, I'm not uh, casting judgments, okay, this is, uh, I'm trying to be an histori art historian and sort of stay remo as, at a remove from um, judgmental principles, and that's really not what I'm interested in. But the, the facts are the facts. Alexei Shusev is the architect of this extraordinary monastery to, the, to your left, which was designed, uh, founded, financed by the holy martyr, Saint Elizabeth, Grand Duchess Elizabeth, and her uh, sister in, in spiritual sister, Sister Barbara, uh, both of them and Elizabeth had, uh, Saint Elizabeth had an extraordinary vision, had a great sense of art, you know, she was a very, very deeply aesthetic person. She worked side by side with Alexei Shusev, a uh, uh, selected architect to erect this formidable institution with, an ins with a history I, we cannot go into, but which I really, really uh, invite you, if you haven't seen it, when you go to Moscow to, to see. Now, the same individual, uh, some 15 years or so later, is the one who is selected to design the final permanent Lenin mausoleum. And how to reconcile those two realities uh, is to me, as I said to you before, utterly incomprehensible, but again, I'm not uh, casting judgment, who knows who one would, what one would have done in a similar situation, impossible to tell. So Shushchev, 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 sorry, became a very, a major, major architect in uh, the early uh, Soviet world. He had a downfall with Stalin, was pushed out and revived around the, the World War II and uh, died in less, less uh, illustrious position that he had than he had in the 1920s and 30s. Let's go to the next slide. And I was going, I was wondering, really, I was trying to, to wrestle with this, this, this problem. And I thought, how, what, you know, what kind of minds you have to totally let go. And he, he knew what happened to, to the, 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 
uh, new martyr, Saint Elizabeth. He knew they, they all knew what what was the reality, and, and how could they reconcile? Uh, that many of them, in fact, went from one from one system to the next. And here's this quote that I found that kind of seemingly uh, brings some, maybe ever, ever so thin, ever superficial, but some degree of understanding of a rationale, at least, uh, for what happened. Perhaps the most difficult and the, at the same time indispensable thing in architecture is simplicity. And indeed, both buildings are very simple. I personally hate one and I love the other, the first one, obviously, but I leave that to each of you. The simplicity of forms obliges to give them excellent proportions and ratios that would communicate the necessary harmony. So say no more, one might say, you know, this is um, indeed what most architects think about and um, indeed those principles apply to the two buildings we've just seen. But I'm just showing them to you because I am fascinated by the impossible juxtaposition incarnated in the figure of this Alexei Shusev. Let's go to the next slide. Um, so this is the kind of architecture that you would see coming from the, the seeds of what Shusev did. And, you know, each, uh, each leader had his, in his own imprimatur. So this is the, the picture to your left is classical Moscow. This is the, uh, the State University. Uh, the, the top right is what is called a Khrushchevsky, Khrushchevsky is the type of buildings that you still see that proliferated during Khrushchev, obviously, and uh, and then below the Brezhnevsky, the ones that uh, developed in the 70s and 80s. Let's keep going. So we're going deep into the, the socialist realist period. I'm just like, let's go to the next slide. I'm going to go through them uh, with some speed because I'm aware of time and I don't want to keep you uh, too long. So let's uh, just look at this panoply. I mean, you know, I think the images speak by themselves, this kind of cult of personality, which uh, was denounced by uh, Khrushchev after Stalin died. But during 30 years, this was going full steam. Let's keep going. So this Kustodiev festival of the second coming turn. Let's go, let's keep going. And what I'm interested in looking at here is the fact that the very same artist, again, 15, 17 years apart, and only in fact, in some cases, even a few years apart, go from celebrating uh, religious uh, celebration to uh, political celebration with, on a formal basis, you might say that the two carries quite a few visual analogies. Let's keep going. I'm just going to go through this very quickly because I want to enter into, um, so parades and demonstrations. L look at the way, the structure, you know, this, this could not be seen in the West. The, the structure of Lenin, you know, instead of being a, a, a proper religious uh, ceremony or, or celebration, one replaced a, a religious icon by Lenin's uh, face, Lenin's images, and uh, nothing has changed much to the very structure that was inherited from pre imperial Russian celebrations. Let's keep going. We saw this picture to the left uh, in the first presentation, Easter procession, and that was done uh, by an artist, Pierov, who was obviously openly anti clerical, joking about you know, the church and its clerics. And then again, you on to the right. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. This is another aspect of socialist realism, the, uh, what you call, you know, what you might call the hagiography, the saint sanctification of the worker who's the new icon or the new hero of modern society. But look at again how in a bizarre way, they are iconicized, uh, these, these models. Let's keep going. And this is even more true here. Now, this, uh, what's, what's extremely interesting here is that in the 1930s, there's a big push by Stalin to liberate women. Uh, the, the terms, we don't have time to stop here, but down with kitchen slavery, uh, let there be a new household, household life, uh, emancipated woman, build up socialism. 
the, the vocabulary that is being used when in 1931 is not that far from what we hear today in uh, woke culture, culture on campuses and, and in uh, today's society, uh, uh, literally almost a hundred years later. So let's keep going. Let's keep going. So here's the, the, one of the most famous uh, sculpture, Soviet sculpture perhaps uh, of all times. Uh, this was actually put in front of the Soviet pavilion in the 1937 World Fair in Paris, the irony, tragic irony, is that it was facing its frenemy, the Nazi pavilion, which was also invited in uh, the, the World Fair before the war, uh, face to face. So let's go to the next. This is a portrait of the famous Viera Mochina, who created this sculpture. I'm just going to show you now briefly the kind of opposition that I uh, introduced before when I mentioned Alfred Barr's journey to the to Soviet Russia in the 1930s. Now we are post-1945. Russia, the USSR is no longer an ally of the USA. Now let's not forget that the US and uh, the USSR fought together against Nazism in World War II. Okay, but very quickly at the, after the end of the war, these two allies turned into enemies. And they became enemies as well in, that was the beginning of the Cold War, and, and, and it became enemies culturally speaking. So let's see, let's um, rehearse this briefly. So it's total, I mean, two uh, iconic examples of the two different cultures, different visions. Let's go to the next one. But one could, one could also draw parallels between those two absolutely different visions of the world. Uh, but this Pollux, uh, one Pollux huge painting, one of the last paintings he did, which is now in Australia, near Prince F, rest after the battle. Uh, and then uh, let's go to the next one, Anastasia. So we see now, no, the Soviet, Soviet Russia is no longer facing the Nazi pavilion, but it's facing its new enemy, the US. And so every time there is a World Expo, an international cultural uh, fair, or congress of different sorts, you can be almost certain that the USA and the USSR are going to be pitching their own cultural uh, icons in, the, in a very obvious way and against each other. So here's the USSR pavilion, and let's go to the next one, and the same expo uh, in Brussels in 1958. Here's the US pavilion. And so let's move to the next one. So the, the opposition was so dire that in a, in a sense it had almost to either go viral and lead to a war or, or thaw in some, some ways. And so luckily it took the second, second path. And I want, let's go to the next one. This is um, so uh, one of the last effigies of, of Stalin. Let's go to the following one where this is his stage uh, funeral in 1953, one of the grandest funerals of the, 19, of the 20th century ever. Uh, next. And so you see here, uh, by the time when Stalin dies, Khrushchev very soon succeeds him and there is the beginning of what what is known as the thaw so a, a kind of and i want to emphasize kind of in this if this is definitely not a turn to a liberal society for sure but it is certainly a much softer much more open much more willing to to take risks and you're going to see some images and what happens is that suddenly you do see what i br br brought up in the uh, title of this lecture the first seeds of dissent and these two guys komar and melamid who now live in new york who are in their 80s probably were some of the most cynical funny jokesters uh, making fun poking memes about about the stalin the, the soviet era its absurdity uh, and, and so on um, so here they're dressed both of them are dressed as youngsters and young young pioneers of the soviet um, soviet ideology let's keep keep going um, so here you have to to your left um, a depiction of stalin in a moment of self reflection i mean this is also 
very funny and, and sort of turning into a benign human, contemplative, uh, spiritual minded, self questioning individual, Joseph Stalin, who's known as one of the greatest brutal dictators of the 20th century. I show this next to the penitent Magdalene by Georges de la Tour. Kamar, Kamar and, and Melanie definitely want to emphasize this. And of course, this is meant to be provoke, provocative, funny, ironic, uh, and strange. Let's go to the next one. In the same fashion, I'm not going to emphasize this dialogue, but you know, you have in, in uh, the West, Maurizio Catalan, much younger than Comar and Melami, the Italian artist who did something absolutely equally grotesque and, and strange and weird, but funny, showing, depicting Hitler as a, as a youth, as a young man of, in his teens. He is wearing shorts here and he's kneeling, praying. Let's go to the next one. Is an, an image of among many, this one is actually much later than the, the death of Stalin is in the, at, at the debunk at the uh, demise of the Soviet world. It's in Hungary in early 1990, but I just thought this photograph was so interesting. Let's go to the next one. And so this de-Stalinization did not stop the fact that among traditional Marxist groups, Stalin continued to be revered as a major force of uh, the fostering of, of what is known as Marxist Marxism-Leninism. And uh, of all people who celebrated him right after his death is Pablo Picasso, who you see here a portrait, you, uh, you may or may not know that Picasso uh, took uh, membership to the French Communist Party in 1944, 1945, right after the war, and remained a communist until the time he died. And he was one of the Western European heroes of classical Orthodox communism and took this, uh, was invited by the French communist newspaper uh, by one of, well, one of the major, by Aragon major author to illustrate Stalin. Now, let's go to the next one. Uh, this, by the way, I mean, this, this drawing was itself the subject of a scandal. Among whom? Among the communists, because suddenly, you had, yes, a hero, the most important artist of the 20th century, uh, iconographically rending homage to the great dictator of the Soviet, uh, Soviet uh, USSR uh, period, but he was doing it, as you saw, in a modernist style. And you now know full well, I mean, you did before, but this is obviously the case that the Soviet ideological culture did not support modernism. So to have this gigantic hero in the West uh, rendering an homage, but through a modernist item, a, a, a idiom to Stalin was seen as a complete aberrant contradiction of forces. Nonetheless, nobody could ignore Picasso and the USSR completely understood that to have him uh, be a guest in, the, in, in Moscow in the USSR would be a huge asset. And so he was given not one, but several exhibitions during his lifetime. Uh, here's the 1956 one, so three years. And so let's go to the next slide. So here we have the sort of gentle clash celebrated uh, by this image of uh, the young Vice President Nixon uh, with uh, Khrushchev in, in 1959. It's the first time when they actually, the two uh, sides, utter their differences, speak about their visions, their, their cultural differences, society differences, and in, end up speaking about the nuclear war. Let's get to the next slide. Now, uh, another perfect example of what I was talking about with the Picasso affair is the fact that Khrushchev himself, even though he is uh, the author of the thawing period, of the um, melting period, he was known as a complete completely violently opposed, just like Lenin and Stalin before him, to any form of modern art. And there was the so-called Manege exhibition. You see two, two works that uh, were by artists that uh, Khrushchev, not even denigr denigrated, but insulted openly. Go ahead, let's do the next one. And so we go back now to what happens to this generation, the final the, the, this is where we're going to end. We're also going to try to go faster because I'm curious to hear some of your questions.
questions. Uh, what do they have at their disposal? What, what can they work with? They hate socialist realism. They, of course, venerate what Malievich and, and Lisitsky and, and uh, Tati did, but are not able to see this work, these works. These works are actually visible in places like the Museum of Modern Art, the Centre Pompidou in Paris, or the Tate Gallery in London, but not in the USSR. And so the black square becomes yet again a sort of icon, or maybe an anti-icon, something that is referred to, that doesn't exist, that is not visible anywhere, but that is co constantly a point, an absent point of reference. So let's quickly, Anastasia, you can keep going here, just let's go through a whole declension of images of images of uh, referencing, sorry, you, can we go just one back, one back, sorry, uh, two back maybe, yes. So this this is a uh, Italian, Soviet, it, Russian who moved to Russia, who did this decomposition of a Malievich um, painting, working with, with toys, with, you know, part of games, in fact, and let's keep going. Yes, yeah, so another artist who plays on the famous photograph of the, display of the black square that we saw earlier on. Let's keep going. A joke on the, the untitled black square by Trikov, 1981. Keep going. Yulikov, black square three. There are many different versions, the broken black square, the invisible black square. Let's keep going. If we don't have the black square, we have the black box. Let's keep going. And so another form of uh, art that is happening is due, during the years of uh, the last decade, uh, last two decades of the USSR, uh, you have the, the sudden, so here again, Komar and Melami, but with them, we have the beginning of what is known as Moscow conceptualism, collective actions, artists who are taking some of the uh, vocabulary, some of the principal ideological uh, monikers of Soviet Russia and turning it into a joke on an absurd uh, meaning. So this is a work to, to your right that is literally a copy of what you could have seen in the Soviet, in the Moscow streets in the 50s or 60s. Nasha Tiel communism. Our, our goal is communism. Is it? Of course not. These guys soon are going to immigrate to the United States. They cannot stand communism, but they are making a joke about what has become a joke. Um, so next, next please. And we're going to keep going. Let's have the next one. Another form of uh, uh, joke now, this is also by, uh, well, this is part of socialist uh, art, cynicism versus communism. Here you have purely and simply the structure of the banner where all the letters have been obliterated, covered in white, deleted, you cannot read them. This is a joke on the fact that you cannot read what they're, what they're saying, it means nothing. And also the fact that censorship is anyway part and of the everyday language in that society. Let's keep going. Another incredible image that you can see now, it's, it's exhibited at Hunter College right now. These two, two guys uh, uh, are de demonstrating, showing this banner where the, 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 the message is in fact a painting by Franz Klein. Interestingly enough, they decided to invert it to the side but this is a painting by Klein, which is in the Cleveland Museum today. So demonstrating abstraction. Can you imagine you're in 1978 and you drive one of those cars, one of those trucks. Can you imagine what was going on in the heads of those people in the cars? What were they thinking? Um, it's complete absurdity, the, you know, the sort of vacuum, yet very striking and, uh, you know, um, yes, so touching in a way. Uh, I like this comment by a Polish abstract artist who suffered himself from being an abstract artist after the war in Soviet, in, um, yes, Soviet Poland. Painting an abstract painting was equal to defying the absolute uh, rule of Russia. Let's keep going. Keep going. I just want, let's keep, let's roll, keep the, let's keep going. Now, this artist to the left is one of the few who went to prison. His um, uh, language turned, his sort of uh, um, puns uh, were sometimes too testy for the authorities of Soviet art, who on the whole looked at these guys as a, a bunch of lunatics, uh, uh, insignificant and innocent idiots who did not know what they were doing. And certainly the rest of the society, if they did not know what they were doing, the rest of the society would not be 
uh, toxically Im Im impacted by their doing. But uh, Lam was going a little bit too far, looking at Matma, you know, the mother darkness, the, the reversal of the word Mat in, in Russian creates darkness. Uh, so the mother country, the, the darkness, this, uh, and he was doing things even worse than that. He is the one who uh, had suffered the most. Uh, um, let's keep going. So I think I do think on a person who is not part of that group, but is very, very openly referenced to is Andrei Tarkovsky, the great filmmaker. Obviously, you see the relationship with the Peter picture by Bulatov to the right. And let's see another work by Bulatov uh, next. Uh, this floating icon on white background of Lenin, where in 1977, you see the, the utter strangeness, the kind of bizarre surrealist um, uh, aspect of this. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. And here again, uh, Bulatov himself, who takes literally now, not unlike Komar Melamid, he doesn't make fun, doesn't twist the message or delete it. Uh, he takes the Slava. Uh, KPSS, uh, KPSS, which is a communist uh, party of the Soviet Union, so literally the same letters, same fonts, just on top of each other against a beautiful romantic uh, cloud and sky, cloudy sky. Let's keep moving. So this, sometimes, as I said, they were going too far. This particular exhibition couldn't last very long because soon enough, the Soviet authorities sent bulldozers and literally destroyed the entire exhibition. It became known as the bulldozer exhibition, even though the content were not, uh, could not be seen very, very long at all, 1974. Let's keep going. Uh, so Komar and Melamid again, who with a very abstract, hard edge uh, vocabulary, very reminiscent of the West, we're going to see that next, uh, depict the initials of KGB, the KGB. Uh, and let's go, let's go to the next one. You see the relationship with, with Kelly, but here again, the, the parallel between the West and the Soviet world is that in the Soviet world, everything is inflected with a heavy dose of humor, self-deriding cynicism, and, and I would say a real humanism, whereas uh, I love Kelly's work, as well Kelly, but Kelly is a serious abstractionist, no political agenda grafted onto his work. Uh, this is what you see is what you see. Next. So another sort of jokey sculpture. Let's keep going. I just want you to see uh, how to communicate, a joke on the, the possibility to communicate um, uh, in the Soviet world, we create a communication tube. Let's keep going. The, the line, the distinction, the separation, the border, the crossing of the line, you know, New York, Moscow, New York, keep going. Of, of course, uh, this is obviously um, an a other ironic echo to what Barnett Newman was doing all his life, the so-called Zips, to your left, one of major New York school abstract expressionists. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. And I, I find it here interesting how bizarrely this kind of dream or nightmare situation is echoed on both sides of the world. To your, to your right is another picture by Bulatov using a uh, segment of abstraction to, to, to point to what exactly, we don't exactly know. But on the, on the left is a print, uh, American uh, print de 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 descripting a perfect family uh, being sheltered by the power of the nuclear power of the US, USA against any possible uh, danger. Let's keep going. So the, 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 what I'm going to ask you, Anastasia, because I see that the time is uh, uh, clicking, just keep rolling here. What I'm going to show you is the, the, the kinship between Soviet art in the last decades and surrealism and conceptualism. Um, yes, so let's stop here for a second. So these three artists, we've seen them before, two of them were carrying the banner, make a joke, on a work that you see at MoMA by very serious artist, uh, Kosuth, Joseph Kosuth, who invented the three chairs. We saw them just before. The three chairs is a conceptual work. You see one chair that is a real chair, one chair that is photographed, and one chair that is de depicted or defined through its dictionary definition. 
game languages and so on and so forth. Very typical of Western conceptualism. Uh, what these guys from Gniezdo, the Niest, Nest group, uh, is what they do is once Komar and Melamid left the USSR, they recreate this chair situation, but instead pin a photograph of each of the artists who have, def who have defected, who left the USSR, they're absent, they're being missed, and, and it looks as though they could be, they could have been, you know, political prisoners uh, sent to the gulag, sent God knows where, we don't know where they are, this sense of absence. So you see how a conceptual work in the West, in its total emptiness, total cold, clinical way, can resonate in a totally different way within the, uh, within the last few years of the Soviet world. Let's go to the next one. Then the next one, again, the next one. So here they're, uh, you know, appropriating another group, which is a British conceptual group, art and language, but instead uh, turning it on its head. And, you know, I work under the influence of this and this and that, and I influence this and this and that. This is the same artist, Yuri Albert, who uh, was with us um, a few weeks ago. Let's keep going. A joke here by Kabakov, the famous Kabakov, taking on the famous Duchamp uh, the, that who exhibited a shovel. The shovel itself is at the Yale University Art Gallery and who takes a different, different shovel. But the difference is, again, is that he uses it. This shovel was used and he, the, the, the segments, the, the paper document how many you know, inches of snow and they, they've cleaned on such and such dates, etc. Let's keep going. And so finally, one of the most famous collective actions uh, that, uh, yes, that the so-called collective actions put together as there was no, uh, you know, obviously you could not use the telephone for sure uh, because it was sure to be, to be uh, listened to. So the only form of communication, um, there was no iPhone and no, no, no other media. So they had to, to write notes to each other. They would write a note to a dozen or so friends, obviously they had to be very trustful friends. And one of them gave the instructions, you will come to the Moscow train, sta train st uh, st station on this day at this hour, you will take the train to that village, which is two hours north of Moscow. Once you arrive there, you will leave the village towards the east and you will take two, kil two kilometer um, uh, walk and you will arrive in front of a, a white snow field uh, surrounded by an edge of field and there just show up, appear. Uh, and this is the, the title of the, of the work, uh, Appearance, and that is what the work consisted of. So you understand, I mean, it's both totally empty and at the same time so full of the entire weirdness, the entire strangeness of the history of, the, of uh, three quarters of a century of Soviet, uh, uh, history of Soviet ideology and the incapacity to do things, and yet, yet the little interstices of, that are left to do something with it. So let's keep, keep going. Another form of a joke on suprematism, you know, what, how they relate to suprematism. And let's keep going, another a photograph of one of the appearances. Let's keep going. Uh, let's keep, keep going, and let's go, let's go faster through those. Uh, I'm just, keep going, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. So, and now here, this uh, Vadim Zaharov, an exchange of information with the sun. So this takes on a sort of utopian science fiction type of, um, of, of connotation. Let's keep going. This uh, Kabakov, the man who flew into space from his womb. Um, let's keep going. So here, clearly, clearly, they're very, very influenced by the Gagarin situation. And I go back to that quote from John 1.18, uh, no one has ever seen God. And so here's this kind of caricature, Gagarin in space, Boganiet, Boganiet, or Boganiet, and so let's keep going. And a joke also by Komar Melamid on the same, uh, the same um, event. I will not read this long quote by Malievich, but it's extraordinary how prescient he was in 1920 of what happened at the end of the Soviet world. Let's keep going. Joke on the, the pop world, on the, on the uh, American market driven. So even though they were very critical of the USSR, they were also critical of the USA. Let's keep going. 
and another joke on you know um, Gorby, uh, the, the portrait the way uh, he could have been by um, Andy Warhol as if he was Marilyn, keep, keep going. And then this wonderful image, and I think on which we are going to conclude today, also by Komar and Melamid, have you sold your soul? And let's keep going to the next one and returning to the very beginning. Now you understand perhaps a little bit better the extraordinary span of possibilities, possibilities and, but I will immediately argue and say impossibilities. This is uh, this whole century of what happened in, in pre-Soviet Russia, early Soviet Russia, mid-Soviet Russia, and late Soviet Russia is uh, a multitude of complexities and conflictual possibilities and impossibilities from utopia to dystopia. We have a couple of very interesting questions. And the first is obviously about the black square. Igor is writing, it's interesting that Malevich saw the black square as an image of God. I've heard an opinion that this black square is a rebellion against God. This is because black squares don't exist in, nat in nature and therefore his art goes against God's creation. Could you comment on this opinion? Yes, well, that's a, a very, uh, that's a great comment. I'm very, very glad to eager uh, to share my, my thoughts on this. I, I will start saying that what you're saying is, well, you're, you're echoing what uh, not only has been uh, said in, in Soviet Russia, but in the West, I, I, I emphasize, but maybe not enough, that when, you know, when Barr goes on that very historical moment in 1932-33 and begins by uh, supremacism, somehow he misses the Black Square. I'm sure he, we, he wishes he had bought it, but uh, these were works of art that were celebrated in the West for their non-religious, their completely secular nature. And in the beginning, they were certainly perceived in Soviet Russia as well as being uh, echoes, if not embodiments, of the new godless atheistic society. But while this is true on the perception level, what is also true is what I, what I read. I did not make up those quotes. Those, these are the words of Malievich himself. And so hence, what I talked about as what I announced my talk is saying this would be a series of, of paradoxes, if not outright contradictions. And so the, the strange thing is that Malievich himself and many of his comrades were deeply religious, not only deeply religious, but uh, very, as you saw in one of the quotes, openly critical of the budding USSR, so comparing the budding USSR to a Luciferian uh, society. I mean, how far how further can you go um, in terms of attacking the, the, the regime? And yet, I mean, you know, he died of cancer in 1935. I, my personal, I mean, it's a, it's a very sad thing to, to say, but the, the 30s, are, as you know, are the, the times of the Stalinist purges. I am almost sure that had he survived cancer, he would have ended up in the, in the gulag. It's a, he was too openly critical of the society. But what you're saying is true, and that's that's what I find fascinating is that contradiction embodied within within the square, and which you see in this last last uh, slide, by the way, the middle one. Yeah, we got an interesting follow up um, comment in Genesis. Moses sees God in the brilliant darkness. Perhaps Malevich knew about this, mm -hmm. and people are curious if the cracks in the black square um, it's just the effect of time, or it's been like this since the very beginning. No, okay, that's a good uh, good question. It is definitely the former. It is the effect of time. Uh, you know, the, the me medium, I mean, uh, this is where in a revolutionary or, or war, during World War I, finding ac access to, to great, to medium to paint was difficult. Uh, and apparently he did paint this. There's been a few uh, x-rays made at the Tretyakov's gallery recently that shows that there was another image underneath which would be very interesting to analyze so there's nothing worse than to have two paintings on top of each other they, they dry a different moment and as the drying process goes through the cracks appear there is another one almost a rhetorical question got to know gods to joking about god what's next for russian art i guess we just need the third lecture on the 90s and early 2000s in russian art <laughs> 
<laughs> well, if Misha and yourself uh, invite me, I, I'll, I might think about it. <laughs> that's a, that's very good. No, you're, you're right, actually. I mean, uh, it, what's interesting is what is going on today and how, uh, I mean, by the way, all the artists I mentioned in the late USSR, all of them are alive today. They're in their late 70s, 80s. One of them is in their 90s. Only one of them lives in Moscow. All the others have emigrated to Germany or sometimes to this country. Um, but and they certainly they are well known in Russia 